Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my thoughts on the TV special from the television series, The E-True Hollywood Story, that aired on the E! Network, The Curse of Poltergeist. The TV special that Spielberg does not want you to see. Now... Before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this TV special, I want to give a special shout out to Vonte for requesting this video. If there's another TV show, film, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below, and I will try to get to it as soon as I possibly can. Now, this is a special that I honestly have a lot of fond memories of watching. I remember when this was first announced, and this was the time when I was a really big fan of Poltergeist. I still am a really big fan of Poltergeist, and I remember reading about it, and I think I heard about it on an online message board or something. I was like, oh, I've got to see this. And I even remember recording the special on a VHS tape. I remember recording it on tape. I don't think I have that tape anymore, but I do remember recording it on tape along with the Jaws E True Hollywood story. And I would watch that tape quite often uh, over the years uh, when I was growing up. It was one of the go-to tapes I would go to along with uh, Ghostbusters that was recorded off of HBO and a few others. So. It was something that I was really into, uh, and I, I just love behind the scenes stuff. And I loved the pol I loved Poltergeist, and I wanted an actual special edition DVD, and I didn't get it because Steven Spielberg is just smuck, and that's a whole other story. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, Steven Spielberg is the reason why there is no special edition of Poltergeist on Blu-ray or DVD. Uh, there were some interviews, I think, with Richard Edlin and some other people that were commissioned for the release. I remember reading press releases online before the special edition came out, the anniversary edition, and they were listing all these extra features that ultimately never wound up on the DVD. And for years, I did not know the reason why until I found uh, a Poltergeist fan site and all this information was revealed to me that it was Steven Spielberg. He and his lawyers got involved and put a stop to it. So there's no audio commentary tracks. There's no interviews with anybody. There's nothing. That's why the anniversary edition of Poltergeist is bare bones. It doesn't even have the old vintage featurette from back in the day. Because Steven Spielberg is a schmuck, to put it lightly. Uh, he didn't even give uh, Warner Brothers permission to use uh, behind-the-scenes footage from the vaults. He just put a stop to it. He just said, nope, you're not doing it. And I think it has to do with something involving how much of the film he directed. He did, didn't want to deal with any of the legal issues or deal with his pristine image being tarnished after the fact all these years later because I guess he has such a big ego like he can't stand for it to get knocked down one peg but yeah uh Spielberg is just kind of an asshole when it comes to this movie uh he's the reason why fans will never see a proper special edition of this film never it will never happen as long as he's around and his lawyers are there. I mean, there was a guy who was working on a making of book, like a fan made making of book. And the guy had already gotten a lot of interviews. In fact, one with Craig T. Nelson, Spielberg and his lawyers found out about it and then were like, nope, you're not doing that. So, yeah, <laughs> the tagline that uh, someone on Facebook uh, created for this custom cover for me does fit this special really well. Spielberg doesn't want you to see this special because there's a lot of stuff that shows that he might have been involved with directing in terms of it being a 
uh, collaboration between him and Toby Hooper, uh, as well as other people just outright saying Spielberg did it, or other people saying Spielberg wasn't the director. So there's a lot of this stuff going on, but the fact that Spielberg to this day still is so adamant about there being no interviews and no uh, commentary tracks and no behind the scenes featurettes and documentaries on any of the official home video releases of poltergeist speaks volumes in terms of what really went on on the set so i can't talk about this and i can't talk about poltergeist without also mentioning steven spielberg and how much of a fucking schmuck he is when it comes to this movie uh so i'm glad that someone preserved this documentary at least um uh, i found a pretty good quality uh rip of this film i bought it off of i offer uh and then i made a copy myself because this is not airing again and this is not going to be streaming because of the rights issues with all of the uh the film clips and everything and because of spielberg and his lawyers so uh, I made a copy just in case, and then I also uh, made a DVD-R, so I have an actual physical copy of this, and I added some be extra featurettes and some little behind-the-scenes footage that I found on YouTube, so I have, like, the ultimate special edition of the Curse of Poltergeist documentary by uh, E. But anyway, now let's actually get to the documentary. I know some people are like, what? I want to hear about the documentary. I want to hear about what the curse of Poltergeist is. Other than the curse of Steven Spielberg. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's in about an hour and a half. And it focuses a lot on the idea, the theory that the Poltergeist trilogy was cursed. And there's another documentary which is a part of the cursed film series and shutter that also talks about uh the curse of poltergeist but this is a lot more in depth if you like that if you thought that was interesting you should try to track this one down because it has a lot more interviews a lot more information and a lot of the stuff that's talked about in that is talked about in this and in my opinion the interviews and the overall content of this is a lot stronger than the episode of cursed films it starts out with a little bit of a backstory for steven spielberg and his fear of trees and what he would do as a kid in terms of pranking his sisters with various different horror inspired pranks which i thought was pretty funny there's an interview with uh, one of spielberg's sisters and she's talking about how he would just make their life a living hell and would do all these pranks and shit and i'm like what a what a troll <laughs> uh so it's fitting that he's trolling poltergeist fans to this day uh in terms of not allowing them to have a proper special edition of this movie because he was a troll at a young age so yeah, he would prank his his sisters with these elaborate horror themed pranks and he always wanted to do a horror film and he was always into horror and so this was his opportunity to do that and he felt like taking the suburbs which is something that at the time was considered to be very safe, very harmless at least for the most part, the, la the, the last place you would look for a haunted house, he thought that that was a brilliant idea, and it was. It was a great idea by Spielberg and uh, some of the other writers. So it talks about the genesis of the poltergeist uh, concept, and then it talks a little bit about the, the production and the casting process in terms of getting Joe Beth Williams and getting Craig T. Nelson, who are both interviewed for this, which is really fun to see as a fan of Poltergeist. If you are a fan of this series, this is like must watch. 
because this is like the one opportunity you really get to seeing a documentary about poltergeist because you actually have a lot of people who worked on the poltergeist films who are interviewed for this documentary and you don't see interviews with a lot of these other people anywhere else other than uh material for promotion for uh certain films in the series so yeah you get to hear from joe beth williams talking about how she was initially leery about doing the film because she was doing a lot of serious film work at the time and she thought it was just a horror movie and like whatever and I, I don't you know i don't think this is for me but then she found out that spielberg was, was one of the producers and then she immediately was uh at least curious about it and then she read the script and liked it and then signed on and she's the one that recommended craig t nelson and craig t was then signed and brought on board zelda rubenstein who is also interviewed in this uh she was brought on board later they talk about the search for the actress to play carol ann and how, how they had all of these other uh actresses that were screen tested and and came in for the audition but spielberg literally ran into uh heather o'rourke and the rest is history and they talk about all of that and then they talk about how they used real skeletons on the set of the film and you have Joe Beth Williams talking about the supernatural occurrences that she would experience when she would leave the set and then she would notice uh, pictures on the wall that were crooked and she would straighten them the, you know, the, the night before, you know, she would come home, the, the, the pictures would be crooked. She'd straighten them because she's thinking maybe it's just in my head or whatever. And then she would wake up. And they would, and she would go to the set and then she would come back and then they would be crooked again. Like, <laughs> that's the kind of crazy stuff that uh, was discussed in the interviews in terms of different people who were part of the cast and crew experiencing a lot of legitimately spooky, eerie things. Um, a lot of it was very coincidental, but some of it was legitimately something that you could maybe say could be supernatural maybe they did tap into something maybe they just opened their mind to the other side while they were doing a film of this nature uh i don't necessarily believe that it was a curse because the thing that really gets me is the insinuation that maybe there was some kind of curse that was put on the filmmakers or this series of films uh because of the skeletons that were used in the pool scene even if they were real which they probably were because it was a lot cheaper at that time to use real skeletons there were tons of other films in the past that used real skeletons and there's no talk about a curse for those movies so i think it's a really big stretch to assume that the skeletons that were used in this film somehow led to some kind of curse because the spirits were angry or whatever. Um, I think that honestly comes more from what happened on the set of Poltergeist 2. Uh, I think things are getting confused when it comes to this urban legend. Um, so yeah, they talk about, the whole controversy with Toby and Steven Spielberg, James Karen actually says on camera that Toby Hooper was the director. Uh, the other cast members essentially kind of say the same thing, but then they kind of don't because they talk about how, well, it was a collaboration between Toby and Steven and you don't really get the truth. Really, the only person who's going to provide the truth is Steven Spielberg. And at this point, he's got so much clout. He's got so much uh, respect in Hollywood. Yeah, it would be against the Director's Guild rules at the time in 1981. But come on, man. Just speak Just speak up. Just talk about Just do an interview and tell the truth before you pass away. And none of us know what really happened because I'm sorry. I don't buy Matthew R. Leonetti 
in some interview for Erwin the Head or Joe Blow or whatever the hell it was saying that, oh no, it was Steven Spielberg uh, because of the fact that there are contradictory statements from people who acted in the film, who worked on the set, who were there every day. So I, I don't, I really don't know what the truth is. The film is still a damn good movie. And whether it was a collaboration between Steven and Toby Hooper or whether it was mostly Toby and then Steven would come in and chime in every now and then, regardless, it was a job well done. And uh, this documentary does touch upon those things, touch upon touches upon some of the more difficult to shoot sequences. Uh, Joe Beth Williams talking about how in the scene where she's dragged on the ceiling it was a rotating room and they would just do so many takes and they painstakingly recreated the room to the point where the ceilings had popcorn ceilings so she was getting her arms and elbows and knees scraped and it was so bad to the point where she was bloody and she would take steven aside and she'd be like hey i'm bleeding and then steven would be like Oh, it'll just wipe off and no one will notice. It's just like, and she's like, well, thanks for the sympathy, Steven. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, what an asshole. I told you, Steven Spielberg is just smuck. There's more proof of that right there. Joe Beth Williams is bleeding and he's like, ah, oh, it'll wipe off. Suck it up. <laughs> But he did he did go the extra mile when it comes to this shoot because Joe Beth was very hesitant about shooting the pool scene with all the skeletons because of all the lights that were around it. She was afraid something might happen and she might get electrocuted. So Steven actually did a really uh, legitimately nice thing where he said, okay, I'm going to take the risk. And if you get electrocuted, I'm going to get electrocuted too, because he got into the water, uh, and stood there. Uh, and I guess that gave Joe Beth enough confidence to go out and do that scene. So there are a lot of times where he, where he acts like a schmuck, but there's other times where, you know, legitimately does a nice thing. And I think that was a nice thing on his part to, to provide Joe Beth with, some much needed inspiration to, to uh, do the scene. So they don't really touch upon a lot of cursed happenings that occurred on the set of uh, the first film. Uh, but then they do talk about the murder of Dominique Dunn, who played the older daughter in the film. And that was just tragic and sad. And there are a lot of stuff in this documentary. I got to be honest, it's just really tragic and sad so you got to be in the right mood for this because there's a lot of depressing stuff about death and uh all this kind of just really bleak uh awful stuff that like this really dark cloud that surrounds the the trilogy and surrounds the series of films because of an unfortunate series of coincidences um but yeah you talk about the murder of dominique dunn which is just unbelievably tragic and upsetting because her boyfriend was some obsessed psycho i mean she rightfully was like okay i'm breaking up with you because he was abusing her physically and she was like all right that's enough i'm done and he's the type that wasn't going to take no for an answer so the night that she was strangled to death he sent her a chocolate mask made out of her own face to her doorstep like some morbid death mask and they got into a fight there was a house guest there some guy who i think was helping her read some lines because she was cast to be in the tv show v and her ex-boyfriend showed up they got an argument and he strangled her to death he strangled Dominique Dunn to death, and then there was this trial. He got convicted of a voluntary manslaughter, but he didn't get life 
or a really significant sentence. In fact, he only served two and a half years in prison for murdering Dominique Dunn. Calling it voluntary manslaughter is a stretch. He murdered her. This was not an instance of, oh, yeah, well, whatever. Uh, it was a crime of passion. Because that's what they keep saying. It was a crime of passion. No, it was premeditated. It was 100% premeditated. Why else did he send her a chocolate fucking death mask to her door the day that he murdered her? This guy should not be out on the street. He should be behind bars. I'm not even going to mention his name. I know, I know the guy's a name. I don't remember what his name is at the top of my head. I don't fucking care. The guy's a scumbag. He doesn't deserve his name to be mentioned. Uh, but yeah really upsetting and then they talk about poltergeist 2 and about the casting process for that and how craig t nelson and joe beth williams pretty much only signed on for the paycheck i mean why not i mean craig t's craig t nelson's like uh, it was the most money i've ever made in my entire life i just i just, I just loved his honesty you have interviews with uh, Cray T and Joe Beth Williams and Zelda Rubenstein. And then you also have uh, Brian Gibson, who's the director for Poltergeist 2. You, you, they also bring in this spiritual advisor, this psychic lady, who predicted, apparently, that Brian Gibson was going to direct this movie ahead of time. Which is definitely something that's a little eerie. And she's also the one that handpicked Will Sampson to play Taylor in the film, which I thought was interesting. And speaking of Will Sampson, that's where you get the story where they built this underground cave, this set on the sound stages at, at MGM. And it was supposed to be Kane's underground uh, hideout, you know, where he took all these followers to uh, uh this cave and locked it up and they died and so on because he's just an evil cult uh individual like he's just he's just a it's just the embodiment of evil and just took all these people and just left them to die because uh it was all about control and power so they built this underground set and it's very detailed and very complex but there were a lot of problems that were happening uh, they would be shooting hours and hours of footage and nothing would show up. It would be as if light leaked into the camera and there was no way for that to even happen. Um, and it was getting so bad that Craig T. Nelson just did not feel comfortable shooting on the set. He was like, I don't even, I don't want to shoot on the set anymore. I don't want to do this. I don't know if I can do it. And there's just a lot of bad juju going on, so to speak. And... Will Sampson was an actual shaman and he said, yeah, I feel it. The spirits are angry. Uh, and it was a weird case of life imitating art. And Taylor, who was, you know, Will Sampson, I mean, Will Sampson and Taylor are pretty much the same person. Uh, he's not really acting like that is Will Sampson. So Will, he went to the set late one night because uh, MGM, uh, the execs and, and the producers agreed to leave the door open for him. And he went in late one night and performed an exorcism on the set. And then after he did that, everything was fine. I mean, that's crazy. That's really trippy. Um, but I think that's really where the idea of the poltergeist curse comes from is because of that incident because of that moment where there were a lot of things that were just going wrong on the set and they were way behind in terms of the shooting and then will Sampson does an exorcism on the set and then everything's good and because there's just a lot of creepy stuff going on with poltergeist too you have julian beck who was dying uh he had terminal stomach cancer and uh, he was another person that was handpicked by the spiritual advisor for the film, which is which is also pretty out there. She said something along the lines where he needs to do this for his soul. And uh, yeah, you got Julian Beck, 
who was a trooper and just delivered his best possible performance in what was his last performance as this evil man, which was the antithesis of who he was in reality. But uh, he felt it was very cathartic for him to be evil, to be the embodiment of evil, to essentially play death because he know because he was dying. And it was his way to come term come to terms with the fact that I'm not going to be around on this earth for that much longer. So in a lot of ways, it was him facing death head on. So there's a lot of just really dark clouds kind of hanging around the production. And maybe it was just something that just bred a lot of negativity and a lot of just bad juju. And then uh, Will Sampson came along and took care of it. It's, it's, it's crazy. It really is. It's a crazy story. Uh, but then you have some other deaths that are mentioned of course, Julian Beck who died, I think before the film even premiered, uh, in theaters, Will Sampson died, uh, uh, two or three years later after the release of Poltergeist 2. He was actually pretty young. I mean, he was only in his fifties. And it was some kind of complications that ultimately led to his death. Craig T. Nelson shares this story about trying to go to an Indian reservation. Well, he didn't try to go to the... He went to the Indian reservation. And he was trying to find Will's grave. And he could not find it. And he was about to give up. And he went to this general store. And while he was there, he met what apparently was Will's cousin. And then his cousin took him to the gravesite. And Craig, who was really close friends with Will, by the way, he went to this gravesite and he just was talking about how there were all these cicadas. Just, it was deafening. Just so many cicadas. And then he started speaking and he started saying, Hey, Will. Uh, I just can't, I, I, I just wanted to say hello. He was just doing the whole thing about how, you know, he, he missed him and everything. And as soon as he said, hey, Will, the cicada stopped. It was just dead silent. I mean, wow. <laughs> crazy. Oh, it's being a crazy. There's a great uh, little short uh, clip, an interview with Craig T. Nelson talking about shooting the vomit creature scene and he's very candid and it, it's, it's hilarious because he's doing impressions of the you know, like this 14 year old effects guys talking about you know well you know uh here's what we're gonna do here we're gonna take this thing and we're gonna put it down your throat and and uh what wait wait a second like it's not supposed to do that uh oh because <laughs> he's talking about like how it like went wrong uh it went haywire things uh did not work correctly uh it was it was a, it was a really fun little sound bite from uh, Craig T Nelson because it was just a horrible miserable shoot for everybody involved and what made it even worse when it comes to that sequence is that they didn't get it on the first take they spent this entire day shooting the scene and they got what they thought was a decent enough shot of the effect and then they find out later that something happened to the film and now they had to do it all over again the next day <laughs> so yeah there was a lot of uh mishaps and a lot of pitfalls that that happened when it comes to shooting boulder guys too but they found a way and they got it done and i want to mention a couple other things before I move on to Poltergeist 3 and, and uh, the sad death of uh, what is in essence the series star Heather O'Rourke. Um, there are interviews that are also a lot of fun with the writers. Um, I think it's Mark Victor and Paul. I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's Mark Victor and Paul Grace. I think that's who it is. I think, I, 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 think I got their names correctly. I, I could be completely wrong. It might be Mark Grace and Paul Victor, Victor but um, those two were interviewed, the writers for Poltergeist 1 and 2, and they are 
really fun to to listen to and they have a lot of fun stories about doing the films and writing the movies and how uh a lot, how crazy a lot of stuff was when it comes to the shoot and all these different obstacles that they had to work around with and so on So, Poltergeist 2 was not as successful as the first film, but it still made enough of a profit for MGM to do a third film. Uh, no one else agreed to come back from the original cast other than Heather O'Rourke and Zelda Rubenstein. You have interviews with uh, Gary Sherman, the director, and he's talking about his relationship that he started to form in terms of the friendship with Heather and how close he was getting with her and and uh how that made it even more rough for him to deal with her death he said one of the hardest things he's ever done in his life is having to be the pallbearer for her funeral to carry a casket with this little girl in it you know this precious little girl and he didn't even want to finish poltergeist 3 because uh, the film wasn't necessarily completely finished uh, by the time Heather passed away, he said one of the hardest things for him to ever do, other than carrying her body, was uh, doing those reshoots, doing the shoots with the with the double. He just thought it was just wrong, and just it, it was just one of those things where he didn't want to finish it. But actually, uh, Heather's family uh, actually pushed him forward to to finish the film. And it was also due to the contractual obligations and so on and so forth from MGM. But yeah, Poltergeist 3, a lot of the talk is relegated to Heather's health and how it was declining at the time. Uh, why she had the chipmunk cheeks because of the cortisone that she was on. And Heather's mother is interviewed in this documentary. And, and you really feel for her immensely. Because this whole thing is just so frustrating and sad because her death could have been avoided because it was a lot of just misdiagnosis lazy uh, uh work by doctors it was a congenital thing with her stomach there was something there was a knot that formed congenitally uh, i believe she was maybe born with it and it was never dealt with and they had all these assumptions about what she was dealing with, Crohn's disease or so on. And that's why she was on cortisone, because they thought that she had Crohn's. And one day, uh, her the knot just broke and she died of toxic shock because it was just f filling up and just getting loaded with just toxins and fecal matter and all this other stuff. And then finally, it just hit the breaking point and it was fatal for her and it was something that was uh, avoidable could have been fixed was i think what is it like potentially routine surgery or something like it was one of those things where it, it's just really frustrating because it's like what the f it was it was yeah it was rare but do your job your doctors your professionals you shouldn't be assuming things like oh because i think it looks like this uh, you know, we're going to go with this route, like do, do some more checking, do some more uh, uh, work, uh, look, look things up better. I, I mean, it seemed like something you would have been able to find in a find in a in an MRI or something. You know, it just it just seemed like a lot of negligence and just outright piss poor uh, uh, work by doctors when it comes to Heather and, and, the, and the diagnosis. She was she was just a real sweetheart and she just loved shooting films. She wanted to be a filmmaker and she really went all out there with Poltergeist 3 despite clearly not being uh, in good health. And so, yeah, that was... That was some stuff that was admittedly pretty rough to watch, talking about Heather and her failing health and her ultimate uh, death and the funeral and all of that. And then you had 
other crazy, just wild occurrences on the set. The the stunt man, the stunt coordinator was talking about how during that big explosion in the, in the uh, car park in the parking garage, things went way uh, overboard in terms of the explosion. Like it was bigger and there was more fire than they were expecting. And it was so big of an explosion that even the firemen on the set just dropped their fire hoses and ran off because they were scared, which then led to the stuntman having to go into a fire and save some, uh, I, I think it was like a, some guy who worked in the building and he was trapped in the garage while it was burning. So he risked his life to save this, this uh, technician or this uh, uh, this employee, and then he also went in and got the film, because if he didn't go in and get the film, it would have been burned and would have been lost, and then they wouldn't have the film for the shoot. So I gotta give huge props to the to the uh, the uh, stunt man to to do all that. I mean, he saved a life for one, and then he also saved the the film, which the life is more important than the film, but he still went went the extra mile and and saved the film from uh, the fire and that's another thing probably some people look at oh the boulder guy's curse again with that i'm like no that's just a coincidence it's just an accident it happens when it comes to explosions when it comes to uh stuff on the set i don't buy that that has anything to do with a curse and then they talk about of course how boulder guys 3 did not do well in the box office and how Gary Sherman, he was not able to shoot the ending that he would have liked, that he originally planned, because of what happened, uh, sadly, to Heather. And and then they kind of wrap it up. They talk about Poltergeist the Legacy briefly, but really just for 30 seconds. And then they talk about the curse, and you have interviews from other people who are giving their theories on whether or not the curse is real. And a lot of them are pretty much just saying, no, it's just a series of unfortunate coincidences. And a lot of them are actually understandably miffed and pissed off at this idea that this, this theory still exists, that there was a curse that led to these people dying, uh, who happened to be a part of this franchise uh, Zelda, Zelda Rubenstein, this is one one thing, this is one part from the, I don't know if it was this, no, I think it was Curse of Pol the, the, the Cursed Films episode uh, that dealt with Poltergeist that had this clip, or Zelda Rubenstein even went on a talk show at one point, because after Heather O'Rourke passed away, this tabloid bullshit about the Curse of Poltergeist was just running rampant and she got on a talk show and she just said, this is a bunch of bullshit. And I just, I, I already loved her anyway. And then she goes on this talk show and just speaks openly and just has big swinging balls. And it's just like, fuck that. This is a bunch of bullshit. Like people died, like show some fucking grace and dignity, uh, not necessarily dignity, but show some grace and, and respect for the, for the dead. And she was dead on. It's There is no curse. Uh, but. <laughs> it is something that I, I can understand. Why some people. They don't know the full details. They don't know the full context of things. Might be go like whoa. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe there's super, something supernatural. Maybe they opened a door into, into some uh, dimension. And. They let something in and it caused all these issues and all these things. But I just don't really see that being the case. I mean, nothing happened with the remake except that it was so shitty that it made you want to curse a million times. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't really know what else to say about uh, the Curse of Poltergeist, the True Hollywood Story documentary, except... If you're a fan of Poltergeist, this is a must-see. Uh, you can find it. It's not on YouTube. Uh, it's not streaming officially anywhere. But it's one of those things where if you know where to look, you can find it. Uh, and I do recommend uh, tracking it down if you can. Because 
it's 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 a relatively enjoyable documentary despite the dark subject matter despite a lot of the uh talk being about death a lot of a lot of the talk being about all these on-set accidents and all these other things that happen on on the set of these films but uh it was just a real treat to see so many members of the cast and the crew talk about the poltergeist films and also share their memories of uh the actors and other people involved with the series that are no longer with us some really sweet and just wonderful thoughts from joe beth and craig t nelson and gary sherman and other people when it comes to heather and and uh will and and julian and dominique so yeah I really got nothing else to say, except thank you for watching my thoughts on The Curse of Poltergeist. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.